So without further ado, uh, we'll move on to our next speaker. Um, I'm delighted to introduce uh, Benjamin Albritton, who's a rare books curator and bibliographer for class Stanford Library. Um, we've said it a few times already, we'll say it again. Um, ben has been very kind about getting up at a very early hour to, to join us um, at this, is what is, you know, uh, it's the afternoon for us, but it's very early morning for him, so we're very grateful. So in his role, Ben focuses on enhancing, enlarging, and celebrating the rare books and early manuscripts collections of the Stanford University Libraries. And he works with curatorial colleagues across uh, the different departments in the library to provide support to faculty and academic programs on the use of special collections materials. Um, so delighted to uh, hand over now to uh, Ben. Thank you. Thanks very much, Arlene. And thank you to the Trinity College Dublin team and the IIIF for Research Network for putting this seminar together. It's, it's a, a really wonderful gathering. Um, and I would also like to thank the previous speaker, Mark, for highlighting a number of concerns, which I think I'm going to amplify. I promise we did not coordinate this in advance. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the variety of options that we have working with medieval manuscripts and IIIF. And just a little bit of background to begin with, IIIF grew out of a series of medieval manuscript projects that launched in the, the mid to late 2000s, um, primarily eCodices, uh, the Ramon de la Rose Digital uh, Library at Johns Hopkins University, and the Parker Library on the web at the Parker Library in Cambridge. And one of the first things that we heard from users when those projects launched uh, was a desire to compare digitized manuscripts across repositories. So that's really where the, the medieval manuscript interoperability initiative took off and we, we were able to bring together a number of institutions to start working on this problem uh, and that developed into the initiative that we know as IIIF now. Uh, but if we look at some of the primary uh, needs across comparison, uh, there are still problems that we're running into today. So. As Mark mentioned, you can go to any number of different uh, cultural heritage institution websites now and browse their digital objects. Here we have uh, uh, Chaucer's Canterbury Tales held at the Huntington Library in Southern California. And a user might want to compare that with the Hingert uh, Chaucer at the National Library of Wales. Uh, previously, you might have to have two browser windows up uh, or move between site and site to do this kind of comparison. Uh, but one of the first comparison projects that we built with IIIF was uh, bringing those two manuscripts together in a user-controlled virtual space uh, using the Mirador Manuscript Viewer. And this was very ephemeral. It relied on the Huntington having a IIIF manifest for their manuscript. It relied on Wales having a, a manifest for their manuscript. And it required uh, a piece of software that would allow a user to bring those two things together on the fly. And as you can see, you can then do close side-by-side -side comparison, as Mark was mentioning, very helpful for looking at, um, at variance across witnesses. Uh, and it also enabled um, annotation, so an engagement with the text in the image that you see uh, from a user point of view. And at the time, it was a fairly simple uh, exercise of drawing a box and then adding text that is then uh, annotated to that region of the image so that you can build up a, a fairly complex set of either transcriptions or descriptions. Uh, across witnesses. What that then led to was ever wider and wider user-based collections uh, being pulled together. Uh, and I'm showing here the International Macho Society uh, where there was an attempt to pull together uh, all of the 50-some extant manuscripts with works by Guillaume de Machaut, uh, the French poet and composer in them. And at the time this was done, there were about 38 manuscripts available in IIIF, which gave um, across eight repositories, mostly in um, the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. Uh, but it gave users an ability to compare witnesses in much the same way that Mark was, was mentioning with the Elfrich uh, manuscripts and texts uh, to do some real primary source comparison work. 
What we've seen in the intervening years is an explosion of digitization. Uh, so over the last decade, a number of things have changed. We've seen major institutions uh, start to build very large collections, um, sometimes small collections, all using the IIIF uh, protocols. The Vatican is now over 20,000 manuscripts, so they're moving quite rapidly. Oxford, of course, was an early adopter, eCodices as well. And it was uh, a real delight to see Trinity College Dublin uh, come into the fold as well. Uh, that opens up some questions about discoverability. So instead of going to each of those institutions, we've seen some aggregation tools being developed, particularly the one at Biblissima and in, uh, in out just outside of Paris uh, that brings together about 85,000 medieval manuscripts at this time and growing as they continue to aggregate more. And just to give you a sense of the rapidity of change, uh, we look back about 10 years now to the largest repository, which was eCodices with about 1,400 manuscripts in it, uh, to a real change in scale over about six or seven years to see the Vatican and the BNF really engaging. And I haven't updated this chart, but once we see the German portals, uh, the rest of the European portals, and um, uh, additional institutions in North America, Ireland, the UK, uh, coming on board, uh, that number is jumping rather overwhelmingly. So what can you do with this kind of content? And I'm just going to stop this share for a moment and share my browser. In 2018, I had the opportunity to work with Professor Joe Story and Dr. Claire Bray uh, around their Insular Manuscript Project uh, on a visit to Trinity College Dublin. And we put together a list at the time of manuscripts that were available in IIIF uh, that had insular origins or connections. And what that allowed us to do was build a, a more or less persistent collection for research and study to do things like this, uh, compare uh, opening pages of the Gospel of John across manuscripts in great detail, um, across institutions, all in a user-controlled way. And since, uh, since that visit with Trinity College coming online, we can also pull in uh, the Book of Kells into that comparison, load that up. Oop, doesn't seem to be working today. But anyway, drag and drop as simple as that uh, to pull something in. Um, oh, there we go. Just a little bit of a delay. And so we can compare um, manuscripts within a closed set that was generated by a research project. And as Mark was mentioning, uh, there's a, a sense that that needs to be persistent, that we somehow need to gather that material together uh, for reuse. So I'd like to just talk about a few experiments that we've seen in the field recently and then conclude with some, some problematic aspects of those tools. Uh, here at Stanford, we've been experimenting with a project called Mies, which is basically a Mirador um, research environment. And we can then go back to that uh, comparison that we had set up previously on the fly. And here you can see that we can save a workspace. So I've set up a workspace with the comparisons of the in principio pages across three manuscripts, across three repositories. Um, and we can save it, and we can save the zoom levels, and we can save the arrangement so that you could share those with uh, research colleagues or with a classroom full of students for the kind of close comparison work that you might want to do in a situation like that. In addition, we can annotate those materials. So to help somebody navigate through uh, an in principio page like this, here's the I. We could draw a box around the N and have students decipher this through annotation um, and save those annotations in a workspace uh, that could be accessed either publicly or by a, a group of colleagues or uh, students. So, stop my share then and go back to the PowerPoint for a second. So that sort of hands-on 
sharing and interoperability is great for building small ephemeral projects. Um, I mentioned the Mies software. There are other software tools that are, are allowing you to do things like this. Uh, Mark mentioned stories. Uh, there's an annotation toolkit that came out of North Carolina State University, all allowing you to build these um, sets of annotations, sets of comparisons. Um, but we need to be careful at this point, I think critically for research, about the distinction between software and the distinction between permanence and reuse of the data that drives any given view. Uh, so one of the things that we can do is, uh, as we're talking about data, is consider some of the, the large scale things we can do, like opening uh, triple life materials up to machine learning. In this case, we trained an algorithm to go through and find um, decorated initials throughout about 100,000 pages of manuscript material. Um, and you can see that the algorithm does pretty well. But the reason I'm showing you this is that this isn't ephemeral data. This is coordinates on a IIIF uh, image. Uh, each one of these is a separate image that's being addressed uh, through IIIF and then add it into a web page for display. And if we create data like this and we assume that IIIF is providing a persistent uh, link and access to an image, then we can build up data sets like this that can be reused across projects. Uh, there's a permanence to them. Since this is just an image coordinate and an HTML page, there's an ephemerality to the presentation but there's a persistence to the underlying data. If we look at other projects like stories, um, which Mark mentioned earlier, we can build guided tours through a manuscript at different zoom levels with serious text or uh, lighthearted text or um, whatever is required for a given audience. Uh, that link between the image and the presentation that we're seeing becomes a little less persistent. Uh, so we've got annotations living in a software tool, and we've got the images being addressed through a IIIF manifest. They're being brought together in the software tool, but there is no persistent link between the two. Uh, so as Mark was mentioning, there's a, a real question about how we round trip that data back into the digital object itself, or we guarantee persistence in a publication and peer reviewable way for the, the, um, for the information that's being created. We can also be a little bit um, more frivolous and just open the annotations, our images up to reuse in a very variety of ways like puzzles and things like that where we might not expect persistence and permanence, um, but would still engage a broader audience with the material that we're, we're hosting in our cultural heritage institutions. So to kind of uh, close up here, I echo many of the, the questions that Mark brought up in terms of use of IIIF. Uh, there are some challenges. There's discoverability, and we've seen some of that addressed through aggregators like Vivisima, but it's a big problem in general in terms of levels of discoverability. As Mark mentioned, paleographic terms are not consistent. The titles of individual texts are not necessarily consistent across the medieval corpus, uh, and those are presented in different ways in different countries. So there's there's an object level discoverability and text level discoverability issue that we, we need to address. But there is also the question of discoverability of new scholarship about those digital objects. There's also a question of citability. How persistent do we need this information to be? and uh, how persistent can it be? So the cultural heritage institutions like Trinity College Dublin, like Stanford, are trying to provide persistent links to those um, IIIF images uh, now. Uh, persistent, not necessarily permanent, but certainly persistent enough to sustain long-term scholarship. Uh, but the scholarly products that are being created on top of those digital assets, uh, there is, currently no good persistence link between the two. And there are many questions that arise from that. And then also the sustainability question of the underlying data that we're all presenting versus 
the presentation views that we see in terms of software on top of those and making sure that we keep the data and the software decoupled so that as software changes, uh, the data can be brought back in, in new configurations or in familiar configurations. Uh, so those are my thoughts at the moment. Uh, I look forward to the discussion with the other panelists and I will uh, just thank you now for your time. Uh, and if we're sharing slide presentations, uh, I've put links in here and Arlene, I can give you my slides and we can share those at a, at a later time. Uh, thank you all.